Dream of the Crown Sponsor for the Flyweight Championship of Great Britain, Europe, and the world. It may have been the height of the Depression, but the people of Glasgow forgot their worries and reveled in the glory of their very own world beater. Lynch ruled the ring ruthlessly and doled out boxing lessons to anyone who dared challenge him. He may have been small, but everybody wanted a piece of Benny. This is the very beginning of celebrity culture in the United Kingdom, in sporting circles, certainly. While well, this is the Will Fife and two other great Scotsmen here, there's Alec James and Benny Lynch. Oh, baby, what I couldn't do with plenty of money and you, in spite of the worry that money brings, just a little filthy lucre buys a lot of things, and I could take you to places you'd like to go, but outside of them, I know you. Always with an eye on the bottom line, it was the makers of Scotland's other national drink who recognised the value in having Lynch endorse their strengthening beverage. The money was rolling in. Now he had wealth. That meant he could go drinking every night of the week because he now had, he was flush with money. He liked to drink. He liked to drink far too much. Everyone wanted to say, I know Benny Lynch. I bought Benny Lynch a drink, or more likely Benny Lynch bought me a drink, as he did. He, he bought everyone a drink. He bought entire pubs a drink. Benny the, used to come out you know, the kids used to come running down because Benny would throw money to us. Uh, six misses and dropping the pieces and that. Well, to us that was a fortune at that time. He wasn't stingy with his money. He'd help anyone. You come and tap him and say, oh, he's a of no money. He'd give you some money. He was spending money left, right and centre. I'd take you to places that you would like to go. Honey, his wife, told me the story that she had to get to the state that where she could never ever say to him, oh, I would love this or I would love that, because if he heard that she wanted anything, he just went out and bought it. If she said she wanted a fur coat, he would go out and buy a fur coat. If she wanted a new suite of furniture, he just went out and bought it. He had no conception of management of money. Oh, baby, what I couldn't do with plenty of money and you. Well, you tend to find that not too many accountants take up boxing. Uh, and there's never a shortage of people who are willing to part them from their money. And boxers are, by and large, notoriously poor with their money. When you look at Mike Tyson now, who's allegedly $37 million in debt to the Inland Revenue in America, and uh, that, that's something that's not going to change, I don't think. Money and you. Amongst the world's flyweights, Lynch was peerless. And if one fight proved this, it was the extraordinary 1937 title defence against a future world champion, 19-year-old Peter Kane. It was a sellout fight at Shawfield Stadium. And to the delight of the crowd, a touch of Hollywood glamour was added to the evening in the shape of Oscar-winning actor Victor McLaglen, who turned up and took a bow before the first bell. Then battle commences, and Peter Kane is promptly socked by champion Benny Lynch. But little things like that don't worry Kane. As he settles down, he forces Lynch back, and time and again he attacks with brilliantly timed punches to the body to set the crowd roaring. Kane was a very, very good fighter, but Lynch was brilliant that night. Kane was terrific, outstanding, but he just met Lynch at his best that night. And having cleverly fought his way through the whirlwind tactics of his opponent, he reaches the 12th round, complete master of the situation. He boxed wonderful. Not fighting, not but just boxing, parrying, shitting, ducking, weaving, making him miss. And he boxed perfect. It was a right wonderful fight. And now Lynch begins the battering process. Slowly the life ebbs out of Kane's attack. Slowly his punches lose their bite. Kane is reeling. He can't hold out. It'll be a knockout. But the gong saves him. Then the 13th and last round. The champion goes for the kill. Kane's defense has almost disappeared. He's reeling again. Lynch has got him. Kane is down. You'd think Peter had had enough by now, but after a count of seven, he tries to carry on the fight. It's impossible, of course. Lynch's gloves are flying, raining punches like hail, a hurricane of punishment. Down again. And for the first time in his life, 19-year-old Peter Kane hears himself counted out. On the 13th day of the month, in the 13th round at precisely 10.13. Knockouts were a clear sign of his power, but Lynch was a supreme stylist and a complete boxer. 
He starts like a bullet, walks across, lands the right hand, left hook, oh, drops him like stone with that left hook. And I love the way he moves his head to avoid his opponent's counters. He was a wicked puncher. He put everything into his shots. It comes up close to him and it's the wrong place to be with Lynch. He was really good on the inside. Could chop you to pieces. Looks like he's throwing wild punches, but they're all carefully calculated. He knows what he's doing. Fighters today could even pick up tips from him. On the inside, it was really good. Look, bringing the shot round up the middle, round the side. Again, his stance is unique too. Bounces back, lands the right hand. He used to parry punches with his hands. It was great the way he blocked punches and turned his head down. Brings the left hook up the middle. It's fantastic stuff. You know, watch him turn into the body there. That's the impressive thing. After 12 furious rounds, he decides in the 13th round, I'm gonna hit him to the body. Watch again, body shot, bringing him up the middle. All of these things are still used today. Incredible technique, and this is the end of the fight. You can see it here. No doubt about it. He can really hurt his opponent, take him out. Deadly finisher. Unbelievable. Born into the Gorbos in Glasgow's south side in 1913, just prior to the First World War, Benny Lynch grew up in an era when boxing was thriving, rivaled only in its popularity by football. For Benny, boxing was just about the only opportunity to escape a difficult childhood. The Lynch's were a very poor family. He had his father, his brother James, his mother and himself. But unfortunately, his mother had quite a few boyfriends. Mum left dad and uh, was taken in, as people were at the time, by friends or aunts or uncles, the extended family syndrome. Uh, nowadays, they'd be taken into care by the social work department, but in those days, it was friends and relatives that took over. Winning his first boxing honour at the age of eight, Benny was encouraged to take up boxing by a local priest, Father Fletcher. He showed great promise, which was noted by Sammy Wilson, local bookmaker and a former boxer himself. Sammy Wilson noted how good this young lad was as an amateur boxer, and he took him under his wing, told him that he could make it as a professional, told him he could make it as a world champion. It became a, like a father and son relationship, very close they were together. A way of supplementing his meagre winnings from his early fights was to take on all comers in the boxing booths at travelling fairgrounds, where Lynch's eccentric style soon singled him out. The crowd used to whistle, pop goes the weasel, and that was a popular tune at the time. They whistled that because he had such an unusual dancing technique. This was the way this man kept moving around all the time. The boxing was in a farce. They weren't genuine fights. It was just a sparring session, you know. There were no verdicts to win. Just if you went in the distance, you got your money. It was three rounds you did in those days. You know, you get a battle that was so pound if you're still on your feet after the first round. Still on your feet after the second round, you get about two pounds. And, and after the third round, you're still on your feet, you won about five pounds, which was quite a bit of money in those days. They would travel around in the booze to earn money. And that toughened them up, and that helps develop skills, I think. Uh, thankfully, young boxers don't have to do that anymore. The booths have long gone, but the effort required of today's boxers to match the success of Lynch is as demanding as it ever was. There is no sport harder than boxing. The footballers can sit back in the back wing, take a breather. We take a breather, we get knocked out. It's as simple as that. There's no breather in that ring. Boxing is a very, very hard game. People don't realise how hard boxing is. The training you've got to do, and the rigorous way you've got to adopt your living, eating, drinking and all that. See, most people at ringside, they don't see the six or eight weeks before it. You're out on the roads every morning. You're in the gym every night, sparring. You're in the weekend. You get about one night a week off. No matter how disciplined you are, Suddenly the alarm goes off at six o'clock in the morning and it's windy and rainy and oh no. Gotta get up and do my road work. Gotta go to the same old sweaty gym every day and take the punches in the head just like I had before when I was working my way towards the top. The hardest part is at the weekends, all your mates are going out and they're egging you on to go out and you've got to say, no, oh, I can't go, you've got to go in early, have your early nights. What people don't seem to understand is the effort it actually takes to get up there is, is so onerous on your body and so tough and physically demanding that guys are sort of half worn out by the time they get up there. 